fire scientists are looking for land with gorse and trees to burn with the aim of learning more about fire, how fire behaves. Hugh Wallace, he's a wildlife scientist at Scion, the Crown Research Institute for Forestry and Wood Processing, and he's currently in the field at Port Hills in Christchurch, of course, where the firefighters are still working to extinguish around 40 hotspots. So kia ora, Hugh, welcome to the programme. Hey, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And so tell us exactly, are you in the Port Hills as we speak? Yeah, so we've been out and about, uh, not in, in the fire, but everywhere around it, sort of looking at looking at things to find out about what's happened in this fire-related things, and then also looking for field sites. And what are you seeing um, I mean, a lot of it's a lot of it's stuff that I think everyone can observe. You know, you have these hot, dry, windy conditions. You have lots of plants that have dried out over time, and those are all factors that contributed to this particular fire. Um, and then we're also, of course, like I say, we're looking for field sites. So we're looking for sort of gorse or wilding trees that would be perfect to burn. Mm-hmm. So what do you do with the samples you collect? I mean, you're taking samples from the area this this past week. Yeah, so what we'll do with those is quite often it really matters how much moisture there is in fuels. So just like at home, you don't really want to burn wet wood and fires don't really want to burn wet wood either. And so what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll take samples of the leaves, the branches, the twigs, the grass. We'll take them back to the lab, we'll put them in ovens, we dry them out, and then we can weigh them, the difference between when they were wet and when they were dry, and that tells us the moisture content of the fuels, which has a big effect on fire behavior. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this area of Port Hills, I mean, 2017, I think, was the last time there was a the major, it was a very major fire then. It's happened again. Is this something that we have to sort of expect? Um, or uh, are we growing the wrong things there? Or are the wrong things growing there, as it were? I think, you know, you, you look at it, pretty much anything, any plant will burn eventually. So it's, I don't know how much we can fix by changing what's planted there. But what we really can fix is human behavior. Right. Um, you know, when it comes down to public education and public awareness, that when it when it is these conditions, and you'll you'll hear it time and again, the hot, dry, windy conditions. At those times, that's when the public should be aware. They should be thinking about, you know, should I flick the cigarette butt out, or should I be mowing, or, you know, do I need to be out doing whatever it is I'm doing today at this time? Maybe I should do it early in the morning when it's a little cooler and damper, or maybe just not today at all. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us more about what you are looking for in terms of the land and shrubs? Yeah, so we're looking for sort of um, two unique kind of scenarios. One, we're looking for gorse on a slope. Uh, So if you saw like a hill face covered in gorse and, you know, 200, 300 metres wide, 200, 300 metres tall, with nice continuous gorse. I mean, normally you wouldn't say nice, but for us, gorse can be nice. (laughs) Um, And uh, several blocks of those or on flat ground, uh, we're looking for wilding pines or tall shrubs or immature trees. And again, we're looking for a block anywhere from 200 to 40, 400 metres wide, preferably multiple of those and preferably fairly dense. So no big gaps or cuts through them or anything. And so what you're really wanting is for people to sort of allow you to come on their properties and, and test test the sort of landscape out, as it were. Yeah, exactly. It's... Um, it's quite a good opportunity because the byproduct is that people do have gorse or wildings uh, cleared from their land. Um, and then also it's an opportunity to really contribute to research, to contribute to really leading science. This is this is information that will ultimately be used to prove a whole theory on fire spread that's being done in conjunction with the U.S. Forest Service, San Jose State, University of Canterbury. And it's really looking to change how we see fire, how we understand fire behaves. And... A side effect of that will also be gathering information that will be used to probably develop better fuel models for New Zealand specifically. And so are you getting people coming forward saying, come to my place? You know what? Actually, we have been. Uh, It's been fantastic. We're just about to head over to a property that uh, someone contacted us and said that they had some some gorse they'd like to have burnt. And so you yeah, you go out there and and do the business and get uh, this research underway. That's uh, f- that's fantastic, isn't it? And how do people actually go about doing that? What just get in touch with you, presumably? 
Yeah, the best way to get in touch with us is through the Scion website. Um, that way, you know, quite often we are in the field. It can be a little bit difficult to get a hold of us on any given day. Uh, but they can go to Scion, uh, Scion Research, New Zealand Forest Research Institute's main website, and there's an inquiries page. Or they can go via the Rural Fire Research page, which is the fire team's specific webpage. Mm. Um, under under science webpage, and um, presumably this is mainly areas in in the country rather than in uh, urban areas. Yeah, pretty much. You know, anytime anytime there's that large amount of space that's really suitable for a fire, and part of suitability is doing it safely, and that's something that we work with fens on. It's really making sure that not only the landowner are happy is happy with it, and the fuel breaks around it are suitable, but also all the neighbors are happy with it. Um, that projections are looking good so that we can burn safely under the right conditions and get get exactly the results we want. And the results we want include having the fire stay where we want it to stay. So I guess one question people would have, well, how can we make sure this is safe? A a controlled burn sounds fine. Um, How do you make sure it's controlled? Uh, You know, so I come at this from a background in fire operations in Canada. Um, There's so many ways you approach it, from picking the right days and the right conditions is a huge one. Uh, It is developing the site, so it can be things like adding fuel breaks, and we have calculations we can run to anticipate the flame length and the ember spotting, and we can decide, you know, we might need a fuel break 5 metres wide or it might need to be 40 metres wide. And we have suppression crews on standby. Uh, We'll always have suppression crews on site, helicopters on standby, and then really what makes a big difference with fires is quite often that first first few minutes of response. So we have sprinklers running before the fire goes, or we may well have crews ready to run in and put out any spots if they were to occur. We'll have secondary control lines. So even if it jumps the first control, it ends up being stopped by the second. So there's, a, there's a lot of ways you can prepare for it, which changes changes what you experience between a wildfire and a controlled burn. And are we good at that here in New Zealand, uh, from your Canadian point of view, I guess? Are we good at uh, doing these control breaks and uh, getting rid of the dry foliage and stuff that's uh, that's on the ground, ground cover, if you like? Yeah, I, it's been really interesting to see. We were contacted by a group in St. Arnold, um, and they've been doing amazing things with their uh, protection around their town, and that's uh, that's a very community driven, but it has great buy in from Doc and Fens. Uh, down in Twizel, you've seen like lots of community engagement, a lot of interest, and I think increasingly around New Zealand, people are starting to be aware that it's something that they can actually make a difference in, and that's been really nice to see. Mm. Should we be worried about the, the fire risks associated with uh, with commercial forestry? It's funny that you ask that because that was something that was asked a few days ago as well. I don't think fire risk is specific to any one group or area. Um, I think part of it that people see, if people see a forest burning, it's, it's big, it's scary, it lasts for a little bit. But by and large, I think probably that's a bit of a red herring. Um, most of the fires we see in New Zealand are probably starting in grass, and that's road edges, mm. that's paddocks, that's various places. You have scrub fires. I think to focus on forestry would probably be doing us a bit of a disservice in that we would probably be expending a lot of energy in a place that may not actually have the most benefit. And, you know, with your Canadian background, what's the big difference? I mean, because we hear about the terrible wildfire that fires in, in your homeland. Um, New Zealand's fortunate in that we haven't been hit as hard by climate change yet, so we're not seeing those really peak, hot, dry drought conditions that we're seeing in North America. Um, All our climate models say we're lagging behind, and so that gives us an opportunity to prepare. Uh, Also, the areas involved are so much more massive in North America, and lightning fires are a very common cause of fire there, whereas here it's primarily human-caused. So that's, that's a very big factor. Well, lovely to talk with you, Hugh. Thanks so much. Good luck with your research, and I hope you get lots of people uh, offering their properties so you can get that research well and truly nailed. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you.